Let me go ahead and begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you just for the opportunity that we have uh, to gather tonight to talk about the book of Judges. We pray, Lord, that you would be with us, that you would guide our discussion. We pray, Heavenly Father, that all that we uh, say and do tonight would bring honor and glory to you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So just a couple of, uh, of quick things. Um, hopefully everybody was able to get the link to work on uploading uh, the response paper. Uh, hopefully that worked on the upload on Canvas. If not, you can just email it to me. That's fine too. Uh, and if you ever run across a problem with the lectures, like slides don't flip right or uh, audio is messed up, I, in the past, have watched my lectures to make sure, but that's back when the lectures were like 15 minutes. I just don't really want to sit and listen to myself ramble on for an hour. So I usually check to make sure transitions work from slide to slide, but beyond that, I don't watch them. So if there's ever a problem, just shoot me an email so that I know and I can fix it. Uh, and if there's anything on Canvas or anything in the syllabus or something that doesn't make sense, let me know. Uh, next week is our third meeting. Uh, so next week, if you could let me know the topic or the passage or the theme uh, that you are planning on uh, writing about. Um, uh, somebody said they were going to do uh, something in the book of Ruth. Somebody said they were thinking of doing something in the book of Judges. You can also do something from Joshua all the way through whatever. So uh, I did, um, when I took historical books, I did... Um, uh, honor and shame in first and second Samuel. Um, so you can stay within a book. I've also written a paper on the theme of temple that goes all the way actually from Genesis all the way through uh, the book of Esther. So you, you can do either one. You want to exegete a passage. That's fine. If there's one particular passage that you think is, is really uh, exciting uh, that you want to dig into deeper. Um, you can also do uh, comparative studies if you want. Uh, okay, I'm going to do these two stories and compare the differences between Kings and Chronicles or between 1 Samuel 25 and where it shows up in the book of Psalms. Uh, you know, any of those things, actually I think it's 27, but any of those things, um, that's fine. It's just more a paper on, on, uh, on the historical books, which on the one hand, you might think, hey, this is great. I can do anything I want. On the other hand, you might think, oh, I have no idea what to do. So if you just want to call me up and we can talk through it, that's fine. If you need ideas, suggestions, uh, I'd be happy to, to go through it with you. Um, but uh, yeah, so just shoot me an email by next class period. Hey, this is what I'm thinking of doing. And uh, we'll go from there just so that I, I want to kind of have an idea of what you're doing, not because I don't trust you, but just I want to be able to help you throughout the semester as you continue to do each piece. So if I know ahead of time what it is, then I can kind of do some prep and thinking uh, on my own of, okay, if I was doing the paper, here's what I would do so that I could then be prepared when you have uh, questions along the way. So it's more, it's more for my being better equipped to help uh, more than anything. And it's accountability to make sure you actually think about it before the night that it's due. So, yeah. <laughs> any, uh, any questions on anything in particular in, in the lecture? It's just what you said you would in the lecture you would be talking about. So mm -hmm. I'm curious about all the reasons for including or not including Deborah. And mm -hmm. the yes, uh, I actually cheated. We're actually going to do that next week. Okay. I said we would do it this week, <laughs> and then I then as I started working on it, I realized, oh no, that's actually that's next week. But uh, yes, we are going to talk about Deborah and and Abimelech and the question of if Deborah is not a judge, is Barack a judge? Uh, and uh, actually, there's a, a fascinating um, paper that I downloaded, and uh, if I remember, I'll email it out to everybody, about the uh, Barak is mentioned in Samuel in the list of four judges, but it's not, he's out of order chronologically, and actually, if you do some digging, there's actually a textual variant that it might not necessarily be Barak that was being mentioned. It might actually be Abdon, the, uh, one of the minor judges that's mentioned. Wow. So is Barack a judge? Um, and we'll get a little bit into that. I actually get a little bit into it for next, next week's lecture, but we'll discuss it more in class. Um, and my plan is, uh, I have to talk to the author, but my plan is to submit, uh, get you guys to read a paper on, 
on uh, Deborah being a judge. I don't think I'm gonna have you write a response paper because I just wanna talk about it in class. So rather than doing twice the work, we'll just skip the response paper and, and just discuss it. But we'll discuss that next week um, and discuss why Abimelech is called a king. Because that's another, you know, who was the first king in Israel where I was like, oh, Saul. But I guess technically we would have to say Abimelech. And yet, I suppose if we're going to go there, then we also have to say that, you know, Abraham maybe, because he's kind of treated like a king as well. So you know, there's some sticky issues there. But uh, yeah, we'll get into those all next week. Uh, one of the fascinating things to consider as, as we're getting into that discussion and even this discussion is the artistry of the book of Judges. Uh, artistry is a little bit more difficult to interpret because a, a good artist is just, it's just natural. So you almost pick up on it without ever really thinking. Um, uh, if you've seen uh, or read the book, uh, The Da Vinci Code, um, uh, the character in the Da Vinci Code goes into this big thing about how the horizon on the Mona Lisa on one side is slightly higher than the other. And he's got this big theory as to why, you know, the one side of the painting has the horizon so that it's not a straight line. It's just kind of off center a little bit. And I, it's garbage, but it's, it's interesting that he, you know, he picks up on it and then makes this whole theory about it. it it's tough because you don't always know about the artistry. So, uh, you know, it makes sense that there'd be 12 judges in the book of Judges. But if you take Deborah and Barack out, you're left with 11. But is that deliberate? Is it deliberate because he knows that you should expect 12? And so the fact that there's 11 is this glaring, why are there only 11? Or is it a, no, there's 12 and you're an idiot for thinking there's 11. <laughs> so, and, and sometimes you just don't know, of, you know, what is the artistry there? Uh, the same with the connection between the books of Joshua and Judges and First Samuel. Uh, the more I dig into Judges, the more I'm struck by the connection between the three books. Uh, I don't buy into the whole Deuteronomistic history. Uh, I think, personally, I think that the, the tenor and the writing style between Deuteronomy and Joshua is completely different. And the writing style between 2 Samuel and 1 Kings is completely different. In fact, I mentioned last week how actually the first two chapters or so of Kings continue the style of 1 Samuel and then it just abruptly changes. Uh, which makes me think that Kings is its own thing. Deuteronomy is its own thing. Joshua Judges 1 and 2 Samuel, though, are fascinating because you've either got to make the argument that they all knew about each other's books or it's the same group of writers that are putting it all together. But again, we're left with, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how to come down on, oh, yeah, see, you can definitely see that he's, he wrote this and you're kind of left with theory of, well, this might be likely, but you can't definitively prove. Uh, it reminds me when I was in college, I had a professor, Dr. Samir Masu, and he would always say, um, you know, you can tell me that it's a horse, but it's not a horse. It's a cow acting like a horse. Go ahead. Try to prove to me that it's a horse. Oh, it has hoofs? Ah, it's because the cow is doing such a good job that he put on hoofs. Oh, he's, he's, he's eating hay? Oh, well, that cow, he's even picked up the diet of the horse to convince you that he's a horse. And so the more evidence that you throw at him of it's a horse, he's like, oh, no, it's just because the cow is doing such a good job of being a horse. He's got you fooled. Well, you, you're kind of left with the same thing of you can, you can come up with all this supposed evidence that convinces you that they know about each other, but maybe it's they know about each other because it's the same person. Uh, just this week, I came across something online where somebody said, have you ever noticed that Dwayne Johnson looks an awful lot like The Rock? <laughs> and uh, yeah. Funny thing about that, they look just like each other. Who would have thought? So, you know, you can come up with all this evidence as to why they're similar. <clears throat> Maybe it's the same person who's writing, uh, especially as you're reading in Judges of there was no king in those days, which seems to suggest that he's living in a time when there is a king. So perhaps he's writing Judges and Samuel together. But then is he borrowing from Joshua in a sense to critique Israel and say, look, this is what's so messed up about Joshua. Joshua ends on somewhat of a high note, but 
as the little details at the end of, oh, yeah, and they didn't inherit this. Oh, yeah, and they didn't take this. And after all of Joshua, you might skip over it. So I'm just going to repeat it all at the beginning of Judges so that you know they screwed up and that you don't just take it as a, well, hey, we beat everybody else. Well, except for these guys. No, we really screwed up because we didn't beat those guys. And so just emphasizing old material, again, to highlight it, or did he write the material the first time? And, and it, it's hard to come down on, on, on a definitive yes, it is, or no, it isn't. The nice thing is it doesn't really matter in terms of, of interpreting the text, except to keep in mind, as even when I mentioned with the Deuteronomistic history, that there is a connection between the books. Whether that means the same guy wrote it or not might be pushing it a little, hard, a little far, especially when you get into some of the other uh, kings and chronicles and some of those. But, but at the very least, just remembering that these are not isolated books. These are connected books and they go together very seamlessly so that you go right from the end of Judges into the beginning of 1 Samuel. Uh, and you go right from the end of Joshua into the beginning of Judges. Um, you know, Judges starts with Joshua died. So that's, that's the way, in some ways, that Joshua started. Moses dies. Now Joshua dies. And then you show up at the beginning of, of 1 Samuel, and nobody dies except for Eli and his sons, and everybody's actually kind of happy about that. So the, the, but there's still this seam between the books, that means that we can't totally ignore Joshua and ignore First Samuel and just focus on Judges and say, okay, we're going to talk about Judges. And okay, when we're done with Judges, then we'll, close, we'll put the lid on that one and put it on the shelf. And now we'll go and we'll open our First Samuel container and look at First Samuel. They really dovetail together very nicely. Uh, intentionally, whether it's intentionally through the inspiration of scripture, um, intentionally through the, the author actually repeating and connecting things or whether it's the same guy who wrote it. Either way, we have to read them in light of each other. Um, and that's the case, especially in the first couple chapters of Judges, where he goes all the way back and starts pulling from Joshua and repeating some of those, some of those same thoughts again in, in the book. And yet also we see the same in the first couple chapters of of First Samuel. Uh, in fact, I was struck even today as I was uh, studying in the end of Judges, Judges uh, chapter 18, they asked the question, uh, 18 and 19, who should go up and fight against Benjamin? And they eventually get to the point where they say, should we go up? Will you give them into our hand? And he says, yes, you should go up. I'll give them into your hand. Well, that same question was asked all the way back at the beginning of Judges chapter one, who should go up? Judah should go up. And so we see this long downhill from Judah all the way at the beginning, going all the way down to the end of the book, who should go up against Benjamin. And yet what's fascinating is that when you get to 2 Samuel chapter 6, uh, 5 and 6, you see the same question by David. Should I go up against the Philistines? Yes, go up for I have given them into your hands. And it sounds an awful lot like what happened all the way back in Judges chapter one and what happened at the end of Judges, except now we've gone from the high point of Judah all the way down to the very bottom with going against Benjamin to now going all the way up again to now we're back up with David and asking the same question. So the writer of First Samuel seems to know about what happened in the book of Judges because he seems to deliberately connect things in Samuel with things that took place in Judges, asking some of the same questions, phrasing it some of the same way. He seems to know what's going on in Judges. So that, again, as we're reading Judges, we have to remember Joshua, and as we're reading for Samuel, we have to remember Judges, at least somewhere in the back of our minds, uh, connecting them together. Um, here in uh, in the first couple chapters of, uh, of Judges, uh, especially in, uh, in Judges chapter 1, uh, he mentions in verse 33, he mentions um, that they dwelt in Beth Shemesh, and they dwelt in uh, Beit Ana, and they dwelt in the midst of the Canaanites, and they dwelt in the land. Um, 
excuse me, and they dwelt in Beth Shemesh and Beltanah um, and um, until they were forced into forced labor. What's interesting there is that this Beth Shemesh is actually the Beth Shemesh that's mentioned all the way back in Joshua chapter 19, of uh, the Beth Shemesh that's in the, in the region of uh, Naphtali, uh, which is how verse 33 begins. Naphtali did not drive out the inhabitants. And yet when we get to 1 Samuel chapter 5 and 6, we again see Beth Shemesh because that's where the ark goes up to. It goes up to Beth Shemesh. Um, so you, you've got this connection there, but that Beth Shemesh is the Beth Shemesh that's in Judah which then raises the question, why would you even mention it? Why mention this town that's barely been mentioned at all in the Old Testament? And I suspect that the writer is mentioning it because he knows that you know about the Shemesh that was, Beth Shemesh that was mentioned back in Judges. Uh, especially when you add in um, the, um, the talking about the Philistines and their borders in, um, See where is that? That's in uh, down here. <clears throat> now I'm not seeing it. He talks about the Philistines and their cities. I wrote myself a note here, and now I can't find it. Um, ah, here we go. Uh, verse 18, uh, where it talks about uh, Judah capturing uh, Gaza and its villages and Ashkelon and its villages. Uh, the word for villages, though, is the word for border, uh, which is different than all the way down in verse 27, where it says that they, Manasseh did not capture uh, Beit Shean and its villages, except here the word for villages in verse 27 is its daughters. It's kind of a figurative, figurative phrase. The word for border, though, that's up in verse uh, 19, that's the same word that shows up in 1 Samuel chapter 5 and 6, when it's talking about the five lords of the Philistines and, and how God had struck the five cities of the Philistines and its borders. And it's the same word again. Um, which again, you know, it's difficult to prove and say, oh, yep, he's, he's borrowing from Judges chapter one. Uh, but at the same time, as you read through it in a line, it is interesting. It's interesting word choice that in, in Judges chapter one, you have Beth Shemesh, you have the Philistines and its, its borders with this unusual word being used in, uh, in place of what shows up just a few verses later to talk about surrounding villages. Um, you've got Judah mentioned very positively. And then you fast forward to first Samuel and you seem to have some of the same circumstances that are taking place, especially then when you fast forward to David in second Samuel and you've got David asking the same question that Judah asked twice in the book of judges. Should we go up? Should I go up? It just, it all, it all seems a little beyond the realm of coincidence. How far you can push it, I don't know. But it is fascinating that there is definitely this scene that exists between Joshua and Judges and between Judges and, and First Samuel. Um, probably the more obvious one is the one between uh, Joshua and Judges. Uh, repeatedly here in the book of Judges we read that they did not drive out. They didn't drive out the inhabitants of such and such. They didn't drive out the inhabitants of such and such. What's interesting is that we have words for drive out in Hebrew. Uh, you know, we've got the word for drive out that shows up in Genesis chapter three, uh, garage. Uh, Could have used that word, to talk about driving out. Uh, we've also got the word struck that shows up over, over and over and over again. They struck it with the edge of the sword. 
uh, is how most of our English translations translate it. They struck them with the sword, they killed them. Uh, could have said that, but instead the word that he chooses to use for drive out is an inflected form of the word inherit. Um, that instead of saying uh, they did not inherit it, it's more like uh, they did not disinherit the other people so that they could inherit it. All kind of in one word. If you want to put it that way. Uh, no, it's actually Yarash. In, uh, in, like in chapter, um, I went through and just started circling them because I found it fascinating. So in, uh, in chapter 1, verse 20, um, it says that uh, they, in, uh, they drove out, verse 20, uh, or he drove out, uh, from there the three sons of Anak. So there it's used in a positive sense. Mm -hmm. he, in, he inherited or he, he caused them to be disinherited. Maybe would be the best phrase. He disinherited them. But then it starts to show up in more of a negative sense um, in, uh, in verse 28. Um, uh, the, the Canaanites uh, were eventually put to forced labor. Um, but uh, they did not completely drive them out at the end of that verse. And then 29 again, Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites, did not disinherit. 30, Zebulun did not disinherit, and then all the towns that were there. 31, Asher did not disinherit. And it just, same with Naphtali in verse 33. It, it just goes on and on and on, which makes me think again that he's, he's kind of poking fun at them in a way. Uh, because we have numerous places in the Old Testament that talk about how you will inherit or I will cause you to inherit this land in a positive sense. Uh, Genesis 15, there's the promise to Abraham. They will come back and you will inherit all this land. Leviticus 20, uh, verse 24, he says, you're going to inherit the land. When you come in and inherit all the land, same word, Yarash. Uh, and then Numbers chapter 13, verse 30, 33, verse 53, again, uh, he repeatedly tells them that he is going to uh, cause them to inherit. Um, so Numbers 13, 33 um, says, uh, oh, that's the wrong verse. It's not that one. 13, 30, that sounds better. Uh, 13, 30 says, uh, Caleb silenced the people. We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. And Caleb is the one who drives out the three sons of Anak, so he certainly knows what he's talking about later on uh, in the book. And then uh, Numbers 33, 53, uh, God says, Take possession of the land and settle in it, for I have given you the land to possess. So there it shows up twice in the same in the same passage. And then when we get into Joshua, then it shows up repeatedly because that is really the emphasis in, in Joshua uh, is this idea of taking possession of the land. Um, uh, so in, uh, in actually Joshua 15, 14 is almost a direct quote or it's the other way around. Judges uh, verse, uh, uh, verse 20 is almost a direct quote from Hebron, Caleb drove out the three Anakites, although in Joshua 15, 14, they're actually named. They're not named here. It just says he drove out the three sons of the, of the Anakim. Uh, and then again in Joshua 15, uh, verse 63, he again speaks of inheriting, but here it begins to switch. Judah did not dislodge the Jebusites who were living in Jerusalem, and to this day the Jebusites live there with the people of Judah. Uh, which is now we're, we're seeing this negative take place. Uh, so I, I wonder, I, I don't think it's just judges that is kind of picking on Israel by using this word to inherit, or uh, the word's not really inherit, but kind of like inherit, more like receive or possess. Um, so it does have connotations of inherit, um, but sometimes there's another word for um, for inheritance that can sometimes be used. 
Um, but he, here it's, it's that, that idea of possessing. You're going to go in and possess it because I've given it to you. Already Joshua is beginning to use that word in a negative connotation. And Judges just takes it up and runs with it and repeats it, but then continues to repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. And repeat it. Uh, so Judges is not unique in using this particular word to pick on the Israelites, but he, he is continuing something that began in Joshua. Again, whether or not he's the same guy or not, it's at least used, used again. And yet it's used in, filtered through his, his perspective in the book of Judges because the book of Judges is very positive on the tribe of Judah. Um, it, it, it just becomes extremely obvious. In fact, one of the scholars points out that when you get to the end of the section on Judah and it talks about how he couldn't drive out the Amorites because they had chariots, it's almost like he's making excuses for them. Uh, well, yeah, they had chariots. So, you know, understandably, <laughs> They had chariots. I mean, let's not kid ourselves here. As though somehow that's that's an excuse. Right after he's already mentioned that Caleb, the 80-year-old, just drove out the sons of Anak from Hebron. But besides that, you know, we should feel sorry for Judah because they uh, they have the chariots and they can't drive them out. And there's very little negative that is said about Judah in the book. There's a lot negative said about Ephraim. Uh, and I'll touch a little bit on it in our, in our next lecture, but Ephraim shows up a lot. Almost every judge has some connection with Ephraim, uh, which may add to the theory that Judges is written in a time when the tribes have already split. And so he's, he's making the South look good and the North look bad. Uh, the only downside of that is that Benjamin kind of ends up as kind of this half, kind of like part of them seems to go with the north and part of them seems to go with the south. Uh, so it doesn't quite work. You know, you, you would think if he was really going to make fun of the Ephraimites, he would pick, you know, a different town to end the book on than Benjamin. So as the book ends, it seems more like he's picking on Benjamin and Saul than just picking on Ephraim. But there is at least some allusions to that. But in Joshua chapter 15, verse 63, he says, Judah could not dislodge or disinherit the Jebusites. They are living in Jerusalem to this day with the people of Judah. And yet, if you look in, uh, in Judges, um, Judges chapter 1, verse 21 and the Jebusites that were dwelling in Jerusalem, they could, the sons of Benjamin could not drive out. So here in Judges, it's different. Uh, in fact, if you, well, there's a footnote in mine that says it could be Judah, but it's interesting that in Joshua, it's Judah, but in Judges, he has a desire to make Judah look good. So, he picks on Benjamin. Can he do that? It could be. Why could it be both? It does say that in the Judah plot against Jerusalem, the well attacked again and struck it again with the sword, and so the city went on fire and went away. Uh huh. Like they're going back and trying to do it again. And yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, a number of scholars have suggested that they destroyed it but couldn't keep it, or the Jebusites took it back somehow, or uh, that you know it's 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 not chronologically in in order in some ways. That yeah, they took it eventually, but they didn't completely drive out all the Jebusites. Like at least later on, the city of Jerusalem was like a city proper, and then the mounts with the, the palace and mm -hmm. all the and, I mean, there's usually, you know, redundant fortifications on a mount like that. Yes. The that are going harder to capture. Uh-huh. Yeah, it, when David goes and sacks the city of, of Jerusalem, they reference the fact that there's a fortress there. They say, you'll never get in here. And they got one, but not the other. Yeah, which is not out of the question. Uh, actually, Ezekiel says that Nebuchadnezzar will sack the city of Tyre, and he sort of does, 
Tyre is built half on the mainland and half on an island. And Nebuchadnezzar never made it to the island. He tried. He actually sacked the town on the mainland and then took all the rubble from the mainland and threw it into the Mediterranean to make a bridge out to the island. But before he got out there, he had other things to do and gave up and went elsewhere. Um, so some people have said, oh, see, Ezekiel's wrong. He never sacked Tyre. Well, he did. He did sack Tyre. He just didn't sack all of it. So yeah, it could very much be a case of they didn't take all of Jerusalem, but they did kill pretty much everybody. They killed its king. They killed, you know, they destroyed the army, but then, yeah, a group of people held up in the fortress and they're like, yeah, we're just going to leave that. We don't, we don't need that. Which we even see that in Judges with Abimelech. Abimelech burns one tower down. When he goes to burn down the second town, he gets a millstone dropped on his head. And that, uh, very satisfying, yes. <laughs> so that tower gets to stand. Um, and it was a woman who dropped it, even it better. Say a certain woman. Yes, a certain woman. I love that certain. A certain woman. Oh, yes. Oh, that woman. That certain woman. Yes. Yes, that's right. Yeah, so that, that's very possible. I mean, when they're talking about Hebron. Uh huh. Run or however you're supposed to pronounce it. Um, and they, you know, when Joshua came, they completely sacked the city. Mm -hmm. Well, it's still there. Yep. In Judges, and it's the seat that is persecuting the Israelites so badly. Mm -hmm. the iron chariots. Yes. So, did they sack it in Joshua? Sure. <laughs> and then, it, I mean, yeah, you run into the same problems. Mm -hmm. Of I don't know. Maybe yeah. they sacked most of it. Part of it came back, reestablished. They sacked it again. Mm -hmm. I mean, these cities were always switching hands. Uh huh. Yeah, and, it does seem like and it was a, a city. It was already built. So even if you sack them, you could come back and well, we've already got fortress. We've got half wall, and it's better to start out in the field. So. Mm -hmm. Yep. You've also got the issue of in both Joshua and Judges. The Jebusites live there to this day with the people of Judah, Benjamin. Mm -hmm. Jerusalem's actually in the territory of Benjamin. Mm -hmm. Judah takes it because of the fact that it's on the border between Judah and Benjamin. They both kind of have parts of it. And David takes it because he wants it for his capital. Mm -hmm. But Jebusites live there to this day, which suggests that at the time of the writing of this particular passage, David doesn't have it yet. Or, as a number of people have suggested, David didn't kill all the Jebusites, which would be odd. Kills everybody else. So it seems odd that he'd be like, yeah, I'm going to leave enemy nowhere else in Israel except the capital. There I'll let the Jebusites live. That doesn't make any sense either. Which is what, you know, this is one of the sticky things of judges. And again, similar to what we talked about last week, one of the things that makes us uncomfortable and provides a challenge to the book of Judges is our concepts of history are different, not in a one is correct, one is, is incorrect sort of way, but we don't write history this way. We write history very linear. This happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. For us to say, you know, so in, uh, in 1812, the, uh, the British sacked Washington, D.C. They built Washington, D.C. out of, and you're like, well, who's the they? The British? The British built Washington, D.C.? Well, no, no, no. I'm talking about when they first built it. Well, why didn't you start there? Why didn't you start with when they first built it? Because you can't sack a city until it's built. So why would you tell me about being sacked and then tell me they built it? We just, that doesn't make sense to us. So we write it very linearly. They built Washington, D.C. It was the capital. There was a war. It got burned. They rebuilt it. We wouldn't say they rebuilt it. There was a war. Oh, yeah, and they built it. That's out of order. But they have no problem writing that way. That doesn't bother them at all. Their whole idea of linear chronology doesn't matter, which you especially see in most of the judges seem to go in linear order. But now we have the whole problem of dating that you saw in the article by Chisholm. Uh, well, how, how do we fit the number of years then into the 300 years that Jephthah mentions, into the 430 years that is mentioned? 
uh, or into the 480 years that Solomon mentions? How do you fit all those dates together? And scholars have tried over and over and over again to get them to fit. Uh, there is some clear overlapping of judges. Deborah, in her song in Judges 5, refers to the fact that she's writing in the days of Shamgar, which you're like, but I thought we were after Shamgar. Well, no, it just says that Deborah was the prophetess. It doesn't say that after Shamgar died, then we have her. It just, you know, it could be overlapping. Uh, we, we don't know that it isn't. Seems to suggest that it is. How long it overlaps? Good question. But then it gets even muddier when we get to the end of the book of Judges, and we've got this whole crazy story of them sacking Benjamin and then devoting to destruction, using that word, harem, devoting to destruction the men of Jabesh Gilead because they didn't come and help out with the sacking of Benjamin. And in the midst of all of that, we're told that Phineas, the son of Eleazar, is with the Ark of the Covenant. Well, if it's Phineas, the son of Eleazar, Eleazar dies at the end of the book of Joshua. So if we're with Phineas, unless we're going to say that Phineas lived 480 years, how do we have Phineas at the end of the book of Judges when all of this is taking place? Not to mention, how do we have a king that shows up one generation later who's a king coming from a tribe of 600 men? So it would suggest that the story of the sacking of Gibeah at the end of the book is not chronologically at the end of the book. It's an appropriate way to end the book, especially if you know that the king that's about to come is from the tribe of Benjamin and from Gibeah of all places, if you really want to pick on him because you're pro-Judah and not pro-Benjamin. Uh, you're pro-Judah, you want to make them look good, so you're going to highlight the rival of David at the end of the book of Judges, but now it's chronologically out of order, which means then we end up making the argument that the book of Judges is linear until it's not, which I've heard that argument made in Revelation and it makes about as little sense there as it does in the book of Judges. <laughs> it's linear until it's not linear. Well, how do you know when it's not linear? Oh, you'll just know. <laughs> well, that, that's not a very good theory. So how do you deal with that? Of We've got this chronological problem but again is it a problem is it a problem for us well sure is it really a problem i don't think so because it's an ancient history they would have understood that that's that's how you wrote so who cares if it's not in order nobody ever said it had to be in order you know are all the events in abraham's life in chronological order i think we assume that they are do they have to be? Is that assumption correct? I don't know. I don't think so. So, uh, you know, th that's just, again, one of those fascinating aspects of what does chronological mean? We make a lot of assumptions as we read the biblical text. A lot of them are helpful, and a lot of them are just common sense. A lot of them are common sense, but maybe not helpful. The Jebusites live in Jerusalem to this day. That means that as the writer of the book of Judges is writing Judges chapter 1, verse 20, he is probably writing that verse when David has not taken Jerusalem. Beyond that, that one verse, we have no idea when the rest of it was written. We assume, oh, it's one author. So if he says that in verse, uh, in verse 20 of chapter 1, that must apply to the whole book. Maybe. What do you think of the theory that Judges was mostly written by one person, but then edited by a lot of different scribes after the exile? Mm -hmm. I, think, I think that that's, it's possible. Again, it's one of those theories I mean, that it's hard to... I mean, you can't prove, you can't disprove, but I mean, they could have put in... Okay, this city used to be this, and this city used to be this. Right. And to this day, you know, you could leave in the to this day from the original author, mm -hmm. but then change some of it because then there's conflicting, seems to be conflicting chronological yep. statements that don't have anything to do with their besides that make you think that, oh, this was way later. Mm -hmm. So, some of it is I just, out. I don't know that it's 
possible to definitively create a timeline for the book of Judges. And I don't know, well, it's not. And I don't know that the writer of the book of Judges would have necessarily intended for us to create a timeline. Yeah. But again, that's the way Westerners think. Well, yeah, you, I mean, you were talking about the artistry of it. I think, I think the downward spiral of immorality uh -huh. is so clear and so deliberately put forward as like an indication of Israel's heart and, mm -hmm. and attitude towards the Lord. I, I think it's almost like this is obviously the point. Like, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Like, giving you a chronological sequence of events is not what I'm after here. Right. I'm trying to show you the heart of the people of Israel during this time. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be yep. an intellectual delinquent. But at the same time, <laughs> I mean, you read Chisholm's article, and then you read his explanation for why his article is probably stupid. I'm like, oh, why did you write this? Mm -hmm. Because you're basically taking Solomon's word over Douglas. Right. You're you're making a judgment call and you're saying, okay, he was exaggerating, this one's not. Right. So you disproved your whole thing and you know yes. you disproved your whole thing, you just don't really like it. Yes. And I I read the whole thing and then went, who cares? And then kind of hit myself in the head of, well, you should care more. And then, really? But mm -hmm. This guy's waxing eloquent about something that he really can't prove, and he's admitted he can't prove. Mm -hmm. And you read the book of Judges, and it was like what you were saying last week of the author of the book of Judges going, don't know who you read when you go. Mm -hmm. You're missing the point. Yes. And I, I think it's fun as an intellectual exercise <laughs> to try to put the book of Judges into chronological order. Like you're in it. Um, you know, one, one of, well, yeah, some of it is just, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a dork and I get that, you know, there's a part of me that, you know, in all of my free time wants to try to put the book of Jeremiah into chronological order, because I don't think it goes in chronological order either. And there are chronological markers that he occasionally mentions. And in some places they're clearly not in order, but which chapter goes where. And, you know, I think that would be fun. And so, yeah, reading the book of Judges, there's a part of me that wants to say, yeah, well, well where, did, where did this take place? But again, if the end story is taking place in the time of, of Phineas, the son of Eleazar, and it's that Phineas, which again is another question, but if it's that Phineas, then we're all the way back at, uh, you know, we're all the way back at, at the very beginning. And then we know it's not chronologically in order, but now, now there's no way to tell. Um, and some of it is, you know, if, if we were writing a book on history, especially if, depending on the era that we're writing in and the reason that we're writing, we're gonna be familiar with the history. You know, especially if this is perhaps being passed on orally before it's written down, you know, we're gonna talk about the Revolutionary War uh, in fact, I, I was teaching a group of kids last week about the Revolutionary War, and it just struck me that I think they go over it for like two days. Everybody knows about the Revolutionary War. You know, you got the British, you got the colonists, British lost. And, it's, and that'd be, that's it. That's all you need to know. That's, that's it. That's kind of the Cliff Notes version. You know, so they talk about Thomas Paine and Thomas Jefferson and you know, but beyond that, how much do you really need to know? Yeah, we went to Valley Forge and we went to, you know, I mean, to some degree, when, you know, when was the Declaration of Independence written? July 4th, 1776. When did the Revolutionary War end? I have no idea. Couldn't tell you. I think the Constitution was, what, 1781 or something like that. That, name, that number sticks in my head. But beyond that, I don't know when it ended, but I know how it ended. And so, you know, does the chronology of of that really matter. I mean, most people are aware, you know, Lexington and Concord and you know, they went to Concord and, or they went to Lexington and then they went to Concord. And then a lot of people don't know that they actually went back to Boston through Amherst and basically massacred the city of Amherst and then themselves got massacred between Concord and Amherst. Mm -hmm. But again, most of us know, you know, okay, we went to Concord, Lexington, Bunker Hill, Saratoga, Yorktown, boom, game over. Oh yeah, and Ethan Allen is thrown in there somewhere because he makes furniture or something. So, you know, you gotta, you, you got all that and it's like, okay, we're, we're, that's it. That's all you need to know.
um, you know, if you're a, you know, a real dork, then you know that Bunker Hill isn't really Bunker Hill, it's Breed's Hill. But, you know, beyond that, nobody cares. So there is a detailed chronology, but most of us, when we tell the story, we know the story. So why are we going to go into this great detail of, you know, I, I, besides Lafayette, name one of uh, Washington's generals. I mean, the only one I know is Benedict Arnold. And I only know him for bad reasons. But how many of us know? Well, not many, but we all know the story. So why does it matter? Well, it doesn't, because we know how it ends. So we just don't worry about it. So you're talking to a group of people and you're like, yeah, so Dan lived there until they went, you know, until the land went into captivity. Well, what captivity? Well, you know that one. Well, which one? Well, that one, you know what I'm talking about. So you don't need to give the detail because everybody knows what you're talking about. You know, the captivity. Well, which captivity? I mean, it's like when I moved here to Roanoke, everybody's like, well, I live on the mountain. I'm like, oh, great. And I talk to the next person. I'm like, where do you live? Oh, I live on the mountain. Oh, your neighbor's with him? No, I'm not neighbors with him. He lives on the other side of town. But you both live on the mountain. Well, yeah, he lives on Poor Mountain. I live on Bent Mountain. Oh, well, why do you call it the mountain? Well, because my mountain's the mountain. <laughs> you know, well, this isn't confusing. If you're from Bent Mountain, Bent Mountain is the mountain. If you live on Poor Mountain, Poor Mountain is the mountain. If you live downtown, then Mill Mountain is the mountain. And it's all the mountain. And I was so confused because I couldn't figure out where anybody lived, except that everybody apparently lives on a mountain. And it didn't make any sense to me. But they all knew. And the writer of Judges is doing the same thing. He's talking to a group of people who loosely know their own history. So he's giving information as a written record. But a lot of this, they already know. Well, Dan lived there until the exile. Or, but which exile? Uh, you know, the same word for exile, gala, is the same word that's used in 1 Samuel chapter 5 and 6. When she says Ichabod at the end of chapter uh, 3 and 4, she says Ichabod because the ark has gone into exile. Very next verse there in Judges, after talking about Dan in chapter uh, 18, talking in Judges about uh, them having the land until the exile, the next verse mentions until the captivity of Shiloh which is what happened with Ichabod. That was the captivity of Shiloh. So is that the captivity? Well, again, I think the writer of Judges would be like, you know which one I mean. No, we don't. <laughs> we don't know which one you mean. Tell us. Well, he didn't feel it was necessary to tell us because he figured either everybody knew or it wasn't that, that much, you know, that important, which makes the whole thing then more confusing for us to a point. But to some degree, does it matter if Dan lived in Dan in that particular territory until the destruction of Shiloh and the Ark of the Covenant went into exile for seven months in Philistia, or that Dan lived in the area of Dan until they went into captivity in 722 with the fall of, uh, through the Assyrians and the fall of Samaria, does it make a difference? Well, some scholars would say, well, yeah, because it tells us when the book was written. But what does that really gain you? What does it really gain you to say it wasn't written in the time of David and Solomon, it was written in the time of Ezra? Maybe it makes us feel better, but I don't know that it really gains us anything. And again, that, that's part of the challenge of chronology is it, it's fun to think about and it's fun to consider I don't know how terribly important it is for scripture. Is there a chronology? Absolutely. Is there a definitive chronology? Absolutely. Are we told definitively what that definitive chronology is? No. So I'm not saying that eh, chronology doesn't matter. It does. No, there is a logic to it and it really works. It just works if you know all the information, which we don't. But I don't know that we need to. So, I, I mean, I like Chisholm's theory. It is curious that the account of Gideon does not start the way the rest of them start. After so-and-so, which allows him to say, oh, well, it starts over at Gideon. Well, that's a theory. I don't know how good of a theory it is, but it's a theory. Uh, and he, you know, accounts, I like, I like the article because he talks about some of the other theories at the beginning of the article of the other ways people have tried to figure it all out. 
but none of them work so perfectly that you're like, Eureka, I've solved it. I now know the chronology of the book of Judges. We're, we're left with theories. You know, we can go with Kay Lawson Younger, who is an absolute genius when it comes to Judges, and just say, nah, what does Jephthah know? Well, that gets us off the hook, but maybe, maybe, you know, maybe Samson is ballparking it. Maybe he's not, you know, 480 comes out to, to 12 generations. Maybe that's what he means. You know, we got 12 generations until Solomon, just like we had 12 generations in Matthew 1 from uh, Abraham to David and from David to the captivity. And even though we know there's actually 13 and we leave out one, but besides that, we'll say it's 12. Uh, it, we don't know. So which one's ballparking it? Who knows? Uh, so it, it is a fascinating issue. It's one of those issues that really continues to bother people in the book of Judges. I, I just, at least within our understanding of ancient Near Eastern history, I just don't know how important it is. So it's important enough we've got to mention it because everybody mentions it. But to some degree, we're not going to come up with a definitive answer. Uh, we might find an answer that we think is great until we read the next article. <laughs> And then change our mind and be like, oh, now that theory I like better. Uh, you know, we're going to keep working on it because that's what scholars do, but I don't know that we're going to come up with a definite answer one way or the other uh, because we have to make so many assumptions. We have to assume that when he wrote verse 20, he was referring to the whole book. That when he talks about Dan in chapter 18, that he's referring to the whole book. And we don't know. We don't know that that's the case. Uh, so it, it just, it, it comes out as a, as a sticky issue, very sticky issue and one that we're, we're not gonna come to a solution on which makes us uncomfortable. Wouldn't have made the Israelites uncomfortable. Cause I, it's not a question I think they would have even bothered asking. Just like the writer of Judges didn't ask, they wouldn't have asked. What's the, what's the point of having a chronological history of the book of Shadow? I mean, we're fascinated by dates and uh -huh. times and facts because- yes. You can decide them off. Uh huh. But we haven't learned anything from it. Uh huh. I mean, I feel like the author of Judges is writing a philosophy of why this happened. Yes. And so if you wrote the history of the Revolutionary War or the Civil War, whatever, which one you wanted to pick, and got down into the nitty gritty of, okay, let's look at the philosophy of rebellion. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the fact that those were mostly Christian Presbyterians who rebelled against the king. Let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. We'll mention some of these other dates and facts as we discuss this, the bigger picture. Yep. But Americans don't like that. No. Or Westerners don't like that. Mm -mm. We want facts. We want dates. Right. But does that give us a good history? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gives us facts and dates. It doesn't give us a good history. Right. So that's what the judges, I think, is more concerned with. Mm -hmm. This is the Israelite history. This is what they were like. Yeah, they went here and here and killed these people over here. Mm -hmm. I also wonder how much of it, kind of along the same line, how much of it has to do with, yeah, we like dates. American history is usually pretty positive. So we remember the dates of World War II um, because it's, it's very linear, it's very positive, it's very, um, here, perfect example. They made a wonderful HBO video series about the uh, European theater. It's called Banner Brothers. It's fantastic. I actually watched it back to back to back to back. I think I watched it five times in a row, start to finish over like four weeks. I just loved it. It was amazing. So when they came out with the Pacific, I went and I saw it. It was awful. It was terrible. I was so confused. I could not for the life of me figure out what happened in Guadalcanal. It made no sense to me whatsoever. So then I did a little research and found out the Guadalcanal lasted for like eight months. And so you're trying to condense eight months into a 45 minute episode. You can't do that. You can condense the Battle of the Bulge into 45 minutes because nothing happened. They sat there in their foxholes and occasionally the enemy came near them. And then eventually the clouds parted and the gifts, you know, the, the packages came in, they got reinforced and they busted their way out. But up until then, you know, it, it was just nothing happened. So the same thing in the Pacific, well, it doesn't work there. All of a sudden it's, it's too muddy, it's too, you know, 
just got thousands of men dying as they're trying to track down these uh, these Japanese soldiers who are you know, killing themselves. And I mean, it just becomes really messy, really bloody, really non-linear. And, and yet, I bet if you did a survey, more people could tell you about what happened in Germany than they could tell you about what happened in the Pacific. We had 8 million men and women that were involved overseas in World War II. 25% of them were in the European theater. 75% of them were in the Pacific theater. And yet when Americans think of World War II, we think of the European theater. It's linear, it makes sense, it's positive. We, you know, aside from a bridge too far and the whole thing over the, or the, the river, whatever river that was, the, the, and that was more of a British thing than an American thing. I don't know that we lost that many battles. I mean, we just kind of kicked butt through the whole thing. It went from D-Day and boom, we just took it to Hitler. Uh, then you get to Vietnam. And all of a sudden it's messy and it's muddy and it's bloody and it doesn't make a whole lot of sense and it's political and it's same with Korea. And you know, then all of a sudden Americans kind of get bogged down in details and dates don't mean a whole lot and you know and then it just doesn't work well if you're an israelite and you're trying to explain your history joshua is very linear we came into the canaanite land and we kicked tail we i mean we killed everybody we killed kings here we killed kings there except for ai we i mean we just destroyed them all and we lived happily ever after then you come to Judges. Judges is like the Israelite version of Vietnam. All of a sudden, you're like, oh my goodness, what is going on? This makes no sense at all. You know, you almost feel like you're, uh, you're reading Apocalypse Now as you're reading the book of Judges. It just doesn't make sense. Of, It's a messy history. And I think, of, I think we like dates, and I think we like clean, crisp, European-style you know, Napoleon and this guy fought here. He lost, he went away. He won, he went home. 10 years later, they did it again. He lost again, he went home. You know, it just, it's very neat and they stand in rows and they shoot at each other. And, you know, it's just, it's very neat. Judges is not neat. It's, it's very messy and there's good things maybe and then bad things and then more bad things and then some good things. I mean, it's just, it's just... It's awful. And so it just doesn't hold well for dates. And so I think even if he gave them to us, I don't know that it would help us any. Because it's like trying to, you know, explain what happened in Guadalcanal or what happened in Vietnam or what happened in Korea. Of, you know, we, we fought for years. Well, where'd you get? Well, we pretty much ended up exactly where we started. You know, 49th parallel. That's where we started. That's where we finished. What happened in Judges? Well, we started and, well, we pretty much finished up where we started. We started up with who should go up and we finished with who should go up. And we started with Judah and we finished with Benjamin. I mean, it just, yeah. So it, all of that just makes it very foreign to us. But if we read it within its context, it works, which I think is why... I think it's why we like Kings and even Samuel better than judges typically, because those kind of flow. Although again, we're making assumptions that Samuel's in chronological order and the reign of David, I, I don't know that it is. Uh, there's Mephibosheth is a whole lot older, you know, he's got kids. So he's, he's a whole lot older than, getting dropped by Jonathan's, uh, you know, nurse when they're fleeing, when Saul is killed. I mean, there's just, there's some fuzziness. Kings though, we love kings. That makes sense. You got this king and then you got this king and then this king dies and he becomes king and this year of this guy's reign and this guy dies in this year of this guy's reign. And, and it just, it makes us feel warm and fuzzy and it all works. Judges does not work. And so I think that's one of the reasons that we, that we struggle with it. But I, again, some of what we talked about last week, not to keep beating a dead horse, I just don't know that it, I don't know that it will ever feel like kings and that we're going to somehow figure out this chronological secret that, oh, now I get it. Because we have to make so many assumptions about the text, even how many judges there are. 
Is it an exhaustive list? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not. You know, is is that particular uh, Phineas that shows up in chapter 20 that's standing in front of the Ark of the Covenant, is that the Phineas who's the son of Eleazar, that Eleazar that dies at the end of Joshua, or is he the Phineas that's in Samuel? And that he's a son of Eleazar because he's descended from Eleazar and maybe his father Eli is the shortened version of Eleazar. I don't know, maybe. <laughs> so, you know, even there, we have to make so many assumptions in order to make it, make it work that at some point it's just, we're not really making it work. We're just forcing a non-Western book into a Western chronology. I and mean, it just, it's not, it's not worth it. Especially when it's been demonstrated that the writer of Judges feels uh, he is willing to change, not change things in a sense of make them incorrect, but he's willing to emphasize that in this town that is the people of Judah and the people of Benjamin, Joshua is going to blame it on Judah, but I am going to blame it on Benjamin because they were both there. So it's not that he's just changing Eh, we're going to scratch out Judah here, just put in the Benjaminites. No, it's, it's on the border between the two towns. They're probably both involved in it. The Jebusites do technically live among both the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin, but he's going to emphasize one more than the other because he doesn't want to make Judah look bad. Which you especially see in the first few verses of chapter one that Judah can't do anything wrong, and then you got all these other tribes that do everything wrong and don't, uh, they don't drive out the, the nations that they're supposed to because uh, they don't have chariots. So it, it's their fault, right? And then when you get to the first judge, the first judge is from Judah, Othniel. Uh, and then, then we end all the way at the end. Uh, we get all the way down to Samson and now we're back with Dan and then we finish with the Benjaminites again. Uh, so yeah, he's definitely, he's definitely writing it from a particular perspective in order to get a particular theological point across. Mm -hmm. And some of this was foretold all the way back in, in Joshua. Uh, actually, in, uh, in Joshua uh, chapter 18, I think it is. Is this the right one? Um, well, Joshua gets mad at them in chapter 18. He says, how long will you wait before you begin to take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has given you? Uh, because already there's some delay, even in Joshua's lifetime, there's some delay uh, as to why they're not going up and taking the land that they're supposed to. Um, in, uh, in Joshua 21, it sounds very positive. The Lord gave Israel all the land he'd sworn to give their ancestors, and they took possession of it and settled there, almost as though they, they didn't do anything wrong. They did exactly what they were supposed to do. Yeah, uh, Joshua 23, verse 9, the Lord has driven out before you great and powerful nations. To this day, no one has been able to withstand you. Which, again, is, yeah, true. But then he says in verse 13 of chapter 23, you may be sure that the Lord your God, uh, this is, actually, I'll begin in verse, uh, verse 12. He says in verse 12, he says, if you turn away and ally yourselves with the survivors of these nations that remain among you and you intermarry with them and associate with them, you may be sure that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you. Instead, they will become snares and traps for you, whips on your backs and thorns in your eyes until you perish from the good land which the Lord your God has given you. Uh, and he talks about snares and traps there, and then we end up uh, being told that they became snares and traps. Uh, so exactly what he said would happen uh, actually ended up taking place, uh, which is, is just fascinating. Uh, the, the other fascinating thing is in, uh, in chapter uh, three, excuse me, chapter two, verse 20, um, oops, still in Joshua here. Judges chapter 2, verse 20. He says, uh, The Lord was very angry with Israel 
and said, because this nation has violated the covenant that I made with their ancestors and have not listened to me, uh, the, the word there for nation is, uh, is actually uh, goy, uh, which is a, it's kind of the Jewish version of gringo. Uh, Jews always called uh, Gentiles goy. Uh, it's in verse 20. Um, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and he said, because of which, because this people or this nation has crossed or has violated the covenant that I commanded uh, their fathers and have not listened to me. Um, the word for nation, this nation, he calls, he calls the Israelites goy, uh, which... Again, it's one of those things I read it and I think, hmm, is that a slip up? I don't think so. I think he's kind of saying, look, you know, this is what separates you from the Gentiles. This is what separates you from the boy. You have my covenant. And you're acting just like them. You're no different than they are. So you, you're not listening to me. They're not listening to me. So well, because of that, then I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to drive out the nations, he says there in, uh, in chapter 2. Beginning in verse 21, uh, he says, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations that Joshua left when he died. I will use them to test Israel and to see whether they will keep the way of the Lord and to walk in it as their ancestors did. Which, when I look at that, I think, well, wait a minute. Did their ancestors really walk in the way of the Lord? Sometimes, yes. Sometimes, yeah. So it wasn't complete abandonment of God, but it wasn't always, uh, you know, perfection either. Uh, which it, it doesn't appear that that's what God is demanding. He, he wants a, a pattern of belief. Because at least under Joshua and the generation after Joshua, it says that they continued to follow after God. Um, so he did not drive them all out at once, giving them into the hands of Joshua. And then now uh, we're also told in, uh, in chapter uh, three, we're told that he left the people there to teach warfare to the descendants of the Israelites who had not fought battles before. So the five rulers of the Philistines, all the Canaanites, he says, which I thought was fascinating. Not, not just five rulers of the Philistines and some Canaanites, but all the Canaanites, Sidonians, Hivites living in the Lebanon mountains from Mount Baal Hermon to Lebo Moth. So is that all of the Canaanites that lived from Mount Hermon to Lebo Hamath? Those are the ones in particular that he's talking about? Or is he saying all Canaanites? I think he means all the Canaanites that live in that particular area. Uh, from Mount Hermon uh, south. They, those are the ones that are left to test, uh, to test the Israelites. So the Israelites lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzite, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, which is bad, but it gets worse. They took their daughters in marriage and gave their own daughters to their sons, and they served their gods. That's where the issue really comes in. Uh, Israel is definitely a little too comfortable with the nations because they, when they become powerful, they make them become slaves. They put them into forced labor. And yet, kind of wonder, why didn't they just kill them? Uh, uh, somebody asked, was it possible that they didn't kill them because they were just tired of all the killing? And it's certainly possible. I tend to think it's more just because of Israelite laziness of, hey, we get slaves. Let's, let's make slaves, put them to forced labor, and we can get them to work for us. And, uh, but then they become a snare and a trap, just as, just as Joshua had said. That's exactly what happens. They, they begin to trip up the Israelites. So the chapter 3, verse 7 starts with, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, which doesn't really surprise you because they've been intermarrying with all the nations. So... They're, they're looking just like all the other goy. They're just like them, and, uh, which is sad, very sad. 
Any questions on uh, chapters uh, one through three? Or chronology or anything we've talked about so far? I think there's definitely some artistry there that they attempted to create certain um, certain motifs or structures. Uh, what makes it more difficult is that sometimes they created the structure so that when they violated it, it was more noticeable. Yeah. And so that that becomes the tricky part of um, you know I, I even asked a professor once about uh, is there meter in the book of Psalms. And he said, well, maybe, but you have to keep in mind that a good poet ignores meter. So did they do meter? Well, sure. Did they do meter? Well, no, because that's what a good poet does. He ignores it. But you have to have it for him to ignore it. So it just because it's a circular argument. So in some places, you can definitely tell what the purpose of the structure was. Sometimes it's a little less clear. Uh, Sometimes, like uh, in the Pentateuch, the focus um, that uh, Michael Morales or L. Michael Morales makes, the point that he makes is that uh, the whole Pentateuch focuses on the Day of Atonement in Leviticus 16. And so you can see the structure chiastically where it begins to repeat in backwards form after Leviticus 16 going you know, they fight the Amalekites. They, they do all the same actions they did before that, but they do them in the opposite order so that it's kind of this focusing in. Well, that one's clear. Other times it's, it's less clear. Uh, you know, Chronicles, he's definitely not just giving a genealogy uh, because he, he leaves people out. He ignores whole family lines. He's definitely got another agenda there. Um, so here in Judges, does he have a structure? Quite possibly. Um, does he have it just so you can violate it? In some ways, it seems to be the case, so that there's this glaring hole when he doesn't say what you expect him to say. Um, beyond that, sometimes it's, it's just hard to know definitively what the structure is. But especially if you were going to communicate it orally, you would have some sort of structure. It's just a mnemonic device, which is why you'll sometimes see phrases repeated multiple times just to get your attention so that you can kind of hold on to it as you're repeating it orally. But yeah, that, that, that's another one of those questions that as a, as a language geek, I really like. I like looking for those structures and, and kind of seeing the, the repetition and the, the kind of that, that infrastructure that he's created for his writing. Um, sometimes it's hard to then extrapolate from that. Okay, well, what was the point of that? And uh, I would put judges in that category. It's just sometimes hard to know why he did it. Um, I, I had one professor that suggested, he was not an Old Testament professor, he was just a preaching professor, but he suggested that the whole point of the structure was to focus on Gideon and that everything leads up to and away from Gideon. And I thought, okay, yeah, I see that. And then the more I studied Judges, the more I thought, now we get to Gideon and we just keep going. You know, it's definitely downhill. Um, yeah, so, you know, all of which say yes, but I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know why he uses the structure that he does. Some places I can tell, but most of the places, at least in Judges, it's hard to know. We'll talk a little bit about it with Deborah, because there's pieces of the structure that we would expect that are missing. Um, yeah. I have a question. Uh-huh. Um, it's a little different off of some of those things. It's interesting that um, 
there's such an emphasis on like the tabernacle and cultic stuff in mm -hmm. the and then first Samuel picks up with the house of God and uh -huh. the ark and all that stuff, but then Judges mm -hmm. is devoid of that. I mean, there's a mm -hmm. little mention of the ark, yep. but there's like no mention of Shiloh, mm -hmm. except maybe once or something. And uh -huh. It's just like, is that deliberately trying to say like this is a godless time? I mean, God is still mm -hmm. obviously doing things and his spirit is coming upon people, but it's almost like the Lord appointed a way for himself to be known. Mm -hmm. And then everyone is a guard yet. Judge. Yes. <laughs> I tend to think that, yes. Uh, again, it's one of those, you know, kind of like with the 11 or the 12 judges. Did he put 11 so that you'd realize, hey, there should have been 12? Yeah. Or were there 12? And it's silly to think there were 11. Did he leave out any mention of the Ark of the Covenant or the priests? Yeah. Because... Except for the one. That's, I mean... Hired household priest, that's obviously... Yeah. I mean, e even when we were talking about... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, even when we're talking about the uh, the judges, the the either the judge, Hashofate, or the judges, the Shofatim, when they're mentioned in uh, Leviticus and in Joshua, and they're usually mentioned alongside the Levites. So there's a point at which, okay, so a judge arises... You're kind of left with, well, why? Where's the other one? Where'd the other judges go? Why do we have this judge? Um, you know, that's especially the question in the story of Deborah of, you know, Deborah's sitting underneath the, uh, the, the palm and she's, uh, she's giving a judgment as a prophetess. But you're still kind of left with, why go to her? Uh, I, I tend to think, and, and there are a couple scholars that have, uh, that have written on it, I think convincingly, uh, one of my professors thinks less convincingly, that prophets seem to arise when things have gone really badly. Um, you know, we, we, have, we have Nathan and Gad who are helping out with David. But the rest of the time we have prophets is usually, I mean, all hell is breaking loose, literally. You know, we have Samuel, uh, we have especially the, the prophets, you know, Elijah and Elisha, and then Hosea and Isaiah. And they tend to show up when the guy who's not doing what he's supposed to be doing is flaking off. And so they show up as almost a critique. So that the mere appearance of a prophet is a problem right. that that itself should be like, Whoa, wait a minute. Um, so that's what makes me wonder. And again, it, it, it's hard to prove the case, but I'm, I'm starting to wonder if either there were lots of judges in Israel and they weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. So of the multiple judges, we get the stories of 11 or 12 to highlight the fact that the rest of them weren't doing anything or there were supposed to be judges, but there weren't. I mean, just like there were supposed to be Levites in the tabernacle, mm -hmm. but whenever a godly King arises, the first thing he does is appoint Levites. Well, you appoint them because there weren't any. So somebody wasn't doing what they were supposed to be doing. And the fact that the book ends with all of this emphasis upon the Levite, mm -hmm and Phineas, the son of Eleazar, and the Ark of the Covenant. And then the book of 1 Samuel starts the same way, Eli, Hophni, and Phineas. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's the same Phineas, but it could be. Uh, you know, so you've got the connections that are made there of, there were no priests paying attention in the book of Judges right. as the book of, of Samuel opens, there's no priests paying attention. And yet it's almost like first and second Samuel and even first Kings to a point, and even especially first Chronicles and second Chronicles is saying, but that's okay because we have a King and our King is a priestly King because we are a kingdom of priests. So we have David who's dancing in a linen ephod before the Ark of the Covenant offering sacrifices. 
I mean, who's who's the uh, who's the high priest at the dedication of Solomon's temple? <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's never mentioned. I mean, I, presumably there is one, but he's never mentioned. Instead, Solomon offers the sacrifices. Solomon prays. Solomon gives gifts. Solomon even gives the blessing. So, who's the priest? Solomon. But Solomon's not the priest. There's a high priest. So, yeah, I, I think that, yeah, there's definitely a gap in judges. But you would expect then that when we get to those last couple chapters in judges, you would expect, but there was no high priest in those days. And instead you get, there was no king in those days. And then when the king comes along, the king builds his temple and you, you get the king who's organizing the Levites and the king who is kind of taking control so that the one time that we get a king, or the, the, the first time that we get a king who is not the priest that he's supposed to be, is Saul. He's offering sacrifices, which is not the problem. He's offering sacrifices when he was told to wait. That seems to be the problem. So he's not the spiritual leader that he's supposed to be. He's just the warrior. Well, that's what Israel wanted. They wanted a warrior. And God says, no, we need a man after my own heart. We need a man like Samuel, who's going to lead not as a judge, but as king, who's going to be my, my son on earth and reign as king. But the line between king and priest is going to be pretty blurred, which is actually fairly typical for ancient Near Eastern cultures, for king and priest to be pretty blurry. Um, there is a point eventually where uh, the the prophets and the priests in other cultures get mad at kings for not listening to them because uh, kings tend to be a little presumptuous in other cultures as well as Israelite culture. But the, the idea of king kind of filling in that gap, there's no priest. The Levites have gone way out there. Phineas is doing nothing. Hophni and Phineas's sons are stealing sacrifices. Oh, finally we got Samuel. Now Samuel's been rejected by the Israelites, what hope is there? Oh, we got Saul. Yeah, that worked out well, uh, but we got David. So, you know, there seems to be this line leading up to David. There was no king in those days. Now we have David. Or depending on when he's writing, now we have, now we have Solomon. And so there's that, that positive note. Yeah. But yeah, so I really think that we should have seen a high priest in judges. Right. So yeah, it seems like those things would be there. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. But it is fascinating. Of, there's no high priest, but it's okay, we have a king. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's not the logical jump that we would think of, right. but it seems to be the one that he's driving us towards. Mm -hmm. uh, there's The high priest isn't doing his job. We need a king. Mm -hmm. um, which, if you, if you take that theme, uh, and actually, um, I forgot the guy's name. It starts with an E. Uh, Merrill, Eugene Merrill, is a, uh, he wrote a book called, I think it might just be called Kingdom of Priests. Mm -hmm. But he's got a whole series of books kind of around that theme. But he, uh, he wrote a Old Testament theology. I wouldn't say it's one of the better ones out there, but he wrote a evangelical Old Testament theology, but that's one of the major themes that he picks up on and traces it as his priesthood. And really, in some ways, that's worth the cost of the book is those particular chapters because he does a really good job on that. He's terrible on everything else. I don't think, he's, I don't think it's well written at all, but the, uh, those particular chapters of tracing the, that theme of priesthood all the way through King and then into the prophets, especially Zechariah, where King and priest come together, and then all the way into the New Testament with Christ. Yeah. It's a pretty fascinating connection that seems to start even in, in Judges. It seems to start actually at the very last verse of Joshua. Mm -hmm. Eleazar died. And there's a part of us that kind of thinks, well, so what? I mean, we haven't talked about Eleazar through the whole book of Joshua. 
we know that he's taken over because Aaron died, but Aaron died all the way back in the book of Numbers and Eleazar took over. And we've barely heard of Eleazar since. Every once in a while he pops up, but it's kind of like, oh, Joshua did, uh, well, yeah, Eleazar was there. But, you know, it's almost like a footnote. And then the last verse of Joshua, Eleazar died. And you're kind of left with, well, so? But then if, if that's the emphasis in the book of Judges is, well, there's no priest doing what he's supposed to do, we know because it's in part of, well, Eleazar died. And Phineas at the end of the book is clearly not doing what he's supposed to be doing. So, you know, Eleazar dies and we're kind of left without a, a godly priest. Mm -hmm. When first Samuel opens, we don't have a godly priest either. And, and I, that's another way that first Samuel really connects with, uh, with judges. Right. Um, you know, first Samuel opens with, uh, there was a certain man in those days from the hill country of Ephraim, which you're like, oh boy, here we go again. What's what craziness is going to happen? You know, he's got two wives, not concubines, but still, we're we're scared. Somebody's going to die by the end of this chapter. We just know it. Somebody's going to die. Uh, we're a little relieved when it turns out to be Eli, but we're we know somebody's going to die. Uh, so again, uh, yeah, I think even just continuing that theme, all the way from Eleazar all the way ahead. But you have to wait until chapter seventeen before you see David, right. and then you got to wait all the way to the end of. For Samuel and the death of Saul, and then you've got David as, as king. And even then, you've got to wait until the end of 2 Samuel and him purchasing the land that's going to become the site of the temple, and then first kings of Solomon building the temple. So from Eleazar all the way there, that's a long gap, yeah. very long gap. But I think you're right. I think that's a significant, significant theme i suppose the technical term for it would be gapping uh sometimes they'll usually it refers to phrases where you know uh probably the one that i think of the most is uh in jonah he says get up go and call out and so then the next verse says so he got up and he went and there's no there's no mention about him calling out yeah. and then a couple of verses later it's like so the word of the lord came to the king not Jonah brought the word of the Lord, just it came. You kind of get the impression that Jonah didn't bring it. Somebody else brought it. I don't know how it got there, but it wasn't Jonah. Uh, so, you know, there's this gap in you would have expected. So he got up and he went and he called out. But they leave a gap there to get your attention of, well, he didn't do what he was supposed to do. And I almost wonder if it's the same thing here of, so Eleazar died. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, similar with Joshua, Joshua died book of Joshua started with Moses, my servant is dead. So now you are going to lead them into the promised land. Joshua, my servant is dead. So there's nobody. Eleazar is dead. And now there's nobody. So there's just this kind of 400 year gap. Yeah. Where you would have expected somebody. So I hadn't noticed until I just looked at it. The Joshua ends. I kind of was similar themes at the end of Judges. Mm -hmm. Early Israel, the son of Aaron died, and they buried him at Gebeah, the town of Phineas's son, which is at Gebeah, the whole country of Ephraim. Mm -hmm. It's like all those same locations. Yes. Right at the end of Judges. Uh-huh. Yeah. It is, uh, it is a pretty, uh, it's not accidental, it's a pretty right. interesting connection that, uh, yeah, we're, we're ending there. Um, So they're persecuting me, and my life is hard, and my life is better, and I'm not, I'm not worried about approaching God. 
offer. They don't go really and offer. Sometimes they offer sacrifices, which are the normal ones. I don't know where but they start. But and you get to the end of Judges, and then you know there was no king in Israel. That phrase is repeating, but also the phrase that every man did what was right in his own eyes is repeating yeah. because of the lack of priests. Right. It's just so they think, okay, well we need a king because we need somebody to approach God. Because what did the other what did the other pagan nations do? The king was like the closest figure. He either was a god, or mm -hmm. well, he was spoke for the gods. Right. So I think Israel almost in taking some of the pagan mm -hmm. cues, you know, they're like, well, well, we need a king because then God will like us, or we'll figure it out. Uh -huh. Yeah. Almost. He'll do. He'll have the relationship with God. Yeah. The rest of us don't need to. He'll fight our battles as our champion. Which is why they wanted Saul, because right. well, our God has to be impressed by our king to be able for our king to approach him. Right. Uh, well, what's impressive? Well, that nation is this guy, and we've got this dude. Yep. You know, yeah. Not, not David. No. Yeah. David is ruddy, and and uh, Goliath despises him yeah. because he's just this young whippersnapper. And yeah, it it, it is it is fascinating that. When you have these shofa team, which comes from shafat to judge, they don't judge very often. I mean, they judge, but the most important thing they do is yasha. They save. Uh, they they Joshua. That's the that's the main thing that they do. Um, so you know, it is it is fascinating that the only person who seems to ever give a judgment in the book of Judges is Deborah, who probably isn't a judge. Which again, I think, is an indictment on the whole system. Something's not right here. So it's great. We've got the judge who's delivering Israel. That's great. But Israel cries out to God. Only in Judges 10 do they ever seem to actually repent. It seems the rest of the time they just cry out, help. And God delivers them. And then they kind of follow God. But as soon as the judge dies, they go back to their other gods. So they're not really putting their faith in God per se, as much as they're putting their faith in in the judge. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I'd like to talk about uh, as we're getting near the end of class here is in uh, excuse me, Judges chapter seventeen. I'm sorry, not seventeen. Uh, Nineteen. Um, Here we go. Uh, actually, it's 18, verse 30. Um, so, uh, uh, verse 30, they arose, uh, or there arose to them, to the sons of Dan, uh, this idol, or they... they Yes, they caused to take to themselves or took to themselves this idol, this thing that uh, um, uh, Micah and his mother have made, which is just a bizarre story. Uh, and they take uh, the Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Moses. Um, there is in Hebrew what we affectionately call the flying nun. A marker in this basket here, maybe. Hold that thought. I'm There's gonna markers in the fellowship hall oh, on that drawing. Oh, nice So we have in Hebrew, we have uh, what's sometimes called the, uh, the flying nun. Uh, the technical term for it is a paragogic nun. Um, and it's a nun that shows up at the end of a, of a word. 
Uh, I'm trying to see if I can just find one here, just as an example. Um, and you're just going to take my word for it because I've not seen one right off the bat here. Uh, but sometimes we put it to uh, to to um, to mark the end of a word that ends with a vowel. We'll put the nun or the letter n just because it reads better before the next letter. Here, though, we have a literal flying nun. In uh, I got the one marker that doesn't work. <laughs> So I'm going to use invisible ink here. <laughs> what are the chances that out of all those markers, I got the one that doesn't work? That's pretty funny. So anyway, uh, the word here in, uh, in verse 30 is uh, Moses, but there's actually a letter N that has been inserted into the text. Uh, typically, <laughs> yes, typically, though, we don't insert letters into the text. So in this particular case, uh, we have, oh, that doesn't look very well either. I'm going to find a marker that works. Honest. Was this supposed to go in the trash can? Yes, I missed. Oh, I'm still <laughs> One of these is bound to work. <laughs> maybe. Maybe one's going to work. <laughs> Hmm. Holy cow. Okay, well, maybe not. All right, so we're going to go with red because that kind of works, maybe. <laughs> Somewhere in here, well, you know what? I, I know where Sean keeps his secret stash. <laughs> Next room. I found it by accident the other day. You're talking about markers, not bourbon, right? <laughs> <laughs> Like a notebook or yep. <laughs> I found it. I found Sean's secret stash. Oh, uh, whiteboard marker and marker. Just watch. This isn't gonna work either. <laughs> oh, it works. No, Sean's stuff always works. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Oops, that's a lousy memo. That's why he hides it. Uh, yes. Well, he doesn't use that classroom anymore. So. <laughs> so the uh, the word for Moses is Moshe. So this is a mem. Uh, mo and then a shin. Excuse my penmanship. Uh, this is a shin and a hey. So Moshe. That's the, uh, the word for Moses. What's interesting though is that in, uh, in this particular case they have inserted a dash and then put a letter N up above it. Uh, and it's literally up above it. Uh, there are uh, a certain number of letters in the text that float above the line like that anyway. And they're usually all represent something like there's one right in the middle of Leviticus that represents the exact middle letter of the entire Pentateuch. And if you went through and counted all the letters in each way, that's the middle letter. And so it's elevated above the line. This one seems to be an attempt to say that it wasn't Moses, but Manasseh. Because uh, this letter here, Shin, sorry, I'm doing terrible with coming ship tonight. Uh, this letter, Shin, has a dot above it. And if it's on the left side, it's a sin. If it's on the right side, it's shin. So it's either shin or sin. Mm -hmm. You can see this if you look up Psalm 119, it has shin and sin. So Moshe is got the dot on the right side. What they have done though is switch it. So that instead of Moshe, it comes up as Manasseh. And they've adapted it. And so there's a lot of debate then over why would they do this? What's fascinating is that this goes back a thousand years. All of our ancient manuscripts have it this way, with the N up above the line. Mm -hmm. Which makes you wonder, well, why wouldn't you just have it in the text? <laughs> well, probably because the, the N is not original. This is one of those instances where it appears that what happened is that they were uncomfortable 
with saying that a, a grandson of Moses, or a, yeah, a grandson of Moses was the problem. So instead they blamed it on Manasseh. Uh, I actually came across an article today. Uh, another interesting theory is that it's not Manasseh, the son of Joseph, that's the Manasseh, but that Manasseh is actually the name of the first priest of the temple on Mount Gerizim in Samaria, when the Samaritans built their temple. Remember the woman at the well, she fights with Jesus over which mountain, is it this mountain or that mountain? And he said, neither. Uh, Mount Gerizim is where the Samaritan temple was. The legend, if you want to call it that, the legend is that um, under when Sanballat in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, when he was the governor, that uh, he built this other temple for the Samaritans and then convinced Manasseh, who was a priest from the line of Levi, convinced him to go over and become the first priest over there and start a new line, which is kind of what's happening here. That you've got this, uh, this guy who is starting his own line of priests. You know, we don't need to be priests in Shiloh. We don't need to be priests in Jerusalem. I'm going to go be the personal priest of the tribe of Dan. What could be better? And that, that's what he's doing, that he's going and he's becoming like that Manasseh. And so that this uh, Nun has been entered in um, in the time period, in the couple hundred years prior to Christ, so that it's not original, and it's not the original authors or even the authors up to the exile that would have been uncomfortable with it, but that the Nun was inserted in the intertestamental period because they were uncomfortable with it, uh, which is not out of the question where I believe there are 18 places in the Old Testament that we know for a fact, because they told us, that the Masoretes actually changed the text because they were uncomfortable with what it said. Um, so the, one of the ones is uh, in, uh, in Genesis 18, it says that the Lord stood before Moses, before he goes down to, um, uh, down to Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, they're uncomfortable with that, that the Lord stood before Moses, so they change it to, uh, to excuse Abraham. me, the Lord stood before Abraham. They change it to Abraham stood before the Lord. But they put in the side note, hey, we changed this, and there are 18 places in the Old Testament where they've done that, where something makes them uncomfortable theologically, and so they've changed it. And they note that they've changed it. Uh, so it's not out of the question that they have marked things like that. Um, so as I read the text, I really think this is, this is Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh. Uh, excuse me, the son of Moses, and that it's been changed to Manasseh because they were uncomfortable with it being Moses. Moses is, you know, it's Moses. Moses is the one who's the, you know, the head of our, of our cultic system. We can't have Moses's grandson doing this. And well, actually, yes, we can, because we do. And they would have been uncomfortable with it. Uh, but I think that's really what's going on here that, yeah, just two generations after Moses, we got some craziness going on here. Um, similar to, we've got Phineas uh, in Gibeah, as we saw there at the end of Joshua. We got Phineas, who's, who knows what he's doing. Uh, so it's just, it, it's odd. It's yeah. very odd. But odd enough that they thought, well, we'll just adapt it and take out the oddity of it and make it less odd by completely removing the reference to Moses. But they had enough respect for the text that they couldn't just add in the letter. Can't do that because that's the word of God. And the, this is the, <laughs> the, again, you want to talk about a cultural thing. You can change anything in the text as long as you don't touch the consonants. So the consonants in Hebrew are inspired. But as far as they were concerned, the vowels and the other markings around it were not. So those you can change. Those you can adapt. So how far back does this? 
it goes change go back to it goes did. back to the oldest manuscripts that we have which probably is 880 so we don't have any manuscripts without uh right uh -huh. we don't uh probably what we would have to do i don't know i don't know that we have any dead sea scrolls of judges mm -hmm. 18 that would be the real definitive to see if it actually was changed. To see if it's there. If it's there, it would be floating there as well. In fact, the footnote here calls it the floating. It says that it's floating. Um, so out this in the, would be one of those edits that was done by maybe a later scribe looking over judges and going, and right. Then going on to this. Yep. How did this may be a stupid question, but how did the patriarchs of Israel become so venerated? Because you keep talking, they keep referencing, you know, your fathers that mm -hmm. were faithful, well, kind of like what you said. You yeah. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you're like, Abraham, yes. okay, Isaac, uh, Jacob, Lord. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. Moses is too perfect to touch. Moses struck Christ. I mean, right. what? Well, I think it's the same, wow. it's the same thing that we see in, um, in Hebrews 11, or in uh, in First Peter, no, Second Peter, Second Peter chapter three, where he talks about Lot, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. and you, you're like, what? He's a believer? Really? Are you sure? You, you know, and you you're kind of like that righteous man. Which Lot are you reading? Is there are there two Lots in the Old Testament? Not they must like you going to hell. That's right. Yeah, exactly. And you know, you're you're reading Peter, and you're like, wait a minute. And I mean, Samson, you read Samson and you think, okay, Samson's not a believer. He's a judge, but he's not a believer. And then you read Hebrews and he talks about the faith of Gideon, who of all the people doesn't have faith. I mean, the whole fleece thing, there's no faith there. And then Samson, and you're left with, wait a minute, are and we just whitewashing history? Jephthah. And Jephthah, yes. <laughs> so you're picking the ones that are like the most screwed up. But I, I think to some degree that is the point. That's the point. That it's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but it's 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 emphasizing the covenant faithfulness of God on the one hand, but also the fact that they had faith. And that's it. They had nothing, they had nothing else to offer. They they believed the covenant. With Jacob, it took him his whole life to get to that point. But as he dies, you can definitely see the faith of Jacob, especially as he's blessing his children that finally you see it but it's almost like okay don't follow other gods mm -hmm. um you know you know I'll, I'll you're a pastor's wife so i can say what i'm about to say but um you know i had a pastor that said to me um the secret to being a pastor is very simple preach faithfully and don't sleep with the women in your church and you know, he's like, that's it. It's, it's not that complicated. It's very simple. This is how, this is what it means to be a pastor. That's it. Two simple things. It's not complicated. And, and yet, you know, you've seen how many pastors violate that. Uh, I, I think the same thing with the Old Testament. Of, yeah, these guys are all screwed up, but it's just don't, don't abandon God and go worship other gods. Trust in God. Almost an indictment too. Like if somebody called you up and was getting mad at you and held Lot up in your face, so yes, this great man. Yes, why couldn't you? How crappy yeah. you think I am? <laughs> You're holding Lot up as the righteous one. I mean, yes, and the Israelites well, must have been really. Good. I read Peter and I'm like, oh, I have a chance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, when he because I I think he compares Noah. I think it's Noah and Lot. Noah, you're like, oh boy, and then Lot, oh good, I got a chance. <laughs> Uh, you know, the same thing of, you know, why can't you just be more like Lot? You know, like, Rick, you want to go there? Let, let's not go there. Uh, so, yeah, you, I, I think that there's a point of, of, it's not that Moses was just so righteous that now we've sung to Jonathan. But he never strayed from righteousness. Yeah. And Jonathan is going and worshiping an idol which again shows how screwed up it is because Micah says that he's making the idol to God. And he even uses his proper name, to Yahweh. I am making this idol 
for Yahweh. And now I know that Yahweh has blessed me because I have my own priest. And you're like, wow, talk about delusional. I mean, it's bad enough that you think making a, a molten image, an idol, is a good thing. And then to think that you have a Levite who's not in Shiloh, he's in your house with your idol and your ephod that you made. It, it just, and he thinks it's okay. And then when Dan comes along, they're like, well, that's a great idea. We'll take your priest and your ephod and your idol because I'm going to have to make one. And, and uh, so a number of scholars have suggested that it's an indictment also on Dan when we get to uh, the book of, of, uh, of Kings and Jeroboam goes and makes the golden calf in Dan. So I think there's some connection there. I think also to some degree, they're also trying to explain, because I, I assume that the Levite in chapter 17 is the same, that it's Jonathan in both stories. You don't have to read it that way. A lot of people don't read it that way. I tend to read it that way. Otherwise, you're just kind of left with the story of Dan of, why is this relevant? Why, why did we need to know all of that? Just to make Dan look bad? Maybe. That just seems odd. But if the connection is, well, this is why we had Joshua or Jonathan go from Bethlehem to Dan, is because of the fact that he's, he, he's the priest up there. And so he's going to all these different places. Um, or, or it's somebody related to him that's, that's going up to see him. But somehow the two stories are connected. So it's not just a random appendices that's tacked onto the end of the book. Uh, yes, he got this Levite and this idol, and yeah, it was weird. Okay, let's go into a real story. No, I, I think the stories are, are connected. And I think that as you read them, it makes sense to read them that way. Of We just talked about a Levite sojourning in Judah, in Bethlehem, and now he's wandering around in the northern part of Israel. So then to mention that we got this guy from Bethlehem who's sojourning and he's in the northern part of Israel, I don't know why you'd think that it's somebody different. Um, yeah, which, all of which seems to say that the two are, are connected. And then we have the whole craziness of should we go up kind of that bookend of chapter one all over again? And, and um, we have the, the, uh, the left-handed Benjaminites. And I'll mention this a little bit for next Thursday, but we started with a left-handed Benjaminite because Ehud is a left-handed Benjaminite and also calling out the hill country of Ephraim. So we've gone from Phineas at the end of Joshua, who's in Gibeah, to now we're in Gibeah again, the same Gibeah in the hill country of Ephraim. We, we just, we've kind of gone full circle. Um, yeah, it's not necessarily the same Gibeah, uh, but probably is. Uh, Gibeah just means height, high hill. Um, so it, it could be a different Gibeah. Um, just like the hill country of Ephraim doesn't necessarily mean that we're in the territory of Ephraim. It just kind of became a general term for that area. Those parts. Yeah, those parts. Yeah, we're kind of in the northern part. Um, yeah. And, yeah, then you just end up with this crazy story of kidnapping women in Shiloh. So there Shiloh factors in. Right. So Shiloh is at least still in existence, and you've got kidnapping women, and, and we've got the 600 men, which is connected to the 600 men probably of Saul, and the dividing up of the concubine, and the dividing up of the oxen, and there's just a lot of connections between the end of the book and the whole story with Saul. Um, so it, it, it's, it's interesting because the there's not as much... Um, theology, if you could call it that, that shows up at the, at the last four chapters the way that there is in the first four chapters. There's just a lot of referencing back to Joshua, a lot of referencing back to Deuteronomy, a lot of emphasis upon uh, the failure of the people and God's punishment of them, and there's very little comment on the last four chapters. 
aside from the refrain, there was no king in those days. And everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Um, but you almost could end the book of Judges after Samson and start the book of 1 Samuel in chapter 17, and it wouldn't really, it wouldn't really affect anything. You wouldn't be like, oh, now we've killed the book of Judges. It makes sense that the Judges uh, is bookended that way, but the last four chapters almost serve as a bridge. Some of the way Joshua serves as a bridge between Deuteronomy and Judges. Last four chapters almost serve as a bridge between the period of the Judges and the period of the Kings. And that uh, really functions that way. But it does so without comment, right. aside from that constant refrain, we need a king. And then, then we start chapter one of for Samuel, we kind of think we're in the same spot. Certain man in the whole country be free. Oh boy. Yeah. Any questions on anything that we've covered tonight? What are we going over next week? Next week we'll actually look at the judges themselves. So we'll dig into the 11 or 12 judges. We'll talk about uh, Barak and Deborah and uh, Abimelech and what we do with those guys. And uh, yeah, and a little bit of the, kind of the structure of them. We won't talk about chronology because we talked about that tonight, but yeah. And then uh, yeah, then the week after that, we jump into for Samuel. So it's unfortunate we, just given the nature of the class, we only get to spend two weeks in judges. Mm. I'd love to spend more time, but we just don't. Are we not spending time on Ruth and doing it later? We're going to do it at the end. Yep. So we'll do we'll do the history all the way through, and then we'll come back to Ruth when we do Esther. So Ruth is either to the last book or the second to last book that we'll cover. So we'll go all the way through. Nehemiah and then do Ruth and Esther. Yep. Uh, yeah, so I'll uh, hopefully post that uh, paper on Deborah, which you guys can read. And then um, you don't have to do a paper on it because we'll talk about it in class. And then, uh, yeah, be thinking about topic and theme for your final paper, even though that's a long way away. And uh, we'll go from this. Yeah. It goes quick. It goes quick. Uh, one thing I think did I put in a spring break week. I think I did. I think it's the week of Easter, after Easter. No class April 1st. Is that what it says? April 1st? Easter the 4th? April 4th. Right, yes. Uh, where's, that's when our Monday, Thursday is. Yep. Um, we, will, we will have class the, uh, the Thursday after Easter, even though for a lot of schools that's spring break, mm -hmm. uh, rather than taking two weeks off. All right.